Hey, it's the Profit Answer Man, Rocky Lalvani. If you're new to the podcast, check out my interview with Mike Michalowicz. It's episode number two. If you want to hear about each chapter in the Profit First book, go back and listen to episodes three through 13. Episode one is the why and how. On the Profit Answer Man, we learn money mastery without all the complicated accounting mumbo jumbo using a simple system. Your accountant is busy documenting your transactions and creating a rear view mirror of what happened. My guess is you don't even look at the reports they sent you. If you're like most business owners, you struggle with this, and it's not your fault. We aren't taught money in school, and accountants aren't taught how to be profitable. The Profit First system created by Mike Michalowicz works, and he certified me to help you implement the system in your business. Remember, the new equation is sales minus profit equals expenses. Let's face it, without cash flow, you can't pay your employees, buy needed materials, or pay your mortgage and support your family. I help you to do that and more so you can focus on the parts of the business you love and receive the rewards for your labor and investment into your business. The stronger you are as a business owner, the more jobs you create, the better we are as a country. Small business owners are the backbone of America, and for that, you deserve to be well rewarded. Just remember, more revenue does not equal more profit. That's why we focus on the bottom line. The biggest problem with being profitable is we have to pay taxes. And that's why tax planning is important. And it's something you do over time, not at tax time. I really hate sending money to the government, but I also don't like letting taxes drive my business decisions. There are so many tax loopholes that it's impossible to keep up unless you specialize in that. And there are so many subspecialties within that. You also need to understand the costs and determine if the tax move is profitable. Today, we're going to share some ideas on this subject. Not to say this is the way you should do it, but to open up your horizons and see how it's possible. Steve Moskowitz knows that his clients' lives and livelihoods can be upended or even destroyed when tax troubles arise. As a tax attorney for more than 30 years, Steve has made it his personal mission to help business owners and individual clients successfully resolve tax issues and go on with their lives. With extensive knowledge of tax law, a desire for swift and vigorous defense, and decades of experience with tax authorities and in the courts, he has an unusual perceptive judgment in assessing the best way forward and the right resources to achieve resolution. Let's meet Steve. Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, Steve Moskowitz. It's great to have you join us today. It's a real pleasure to be invited. Thank you so much. You've asked me to introduce myself to your audience. So I'm a tax attorney. And before I was a tax attorney, I was a CPA. I had a tax law firm. And the reason that I became a tax attorney was for tax planning, because When I set foot into law school on day one as a student, I already had a bachelor's and master's degree in accounting, and I was already a practicing CPA doing taxes. But I looked at the Fortune 500 and I said, look at all the money those companies make, yet a lot of them don't pay any taxes, and it's legal. What are they doing that I could give to my clients? What's hidden in the tax law? And there's a lot hidden in the tax law because The tax law has two purposes. One, we all know about, collect money from us. But the other one, there's a system of incentives. In a democracy, the government can't order us to do something, even if it's good for the economy and the government wants us to do it. So how does the government get us to do something they want us to do when they can't order us? They pay us. And they pay us in the form of tax savings, incentives. And that's what I'm all about. I don't want to be one of those people that moves the numbers from one place to another and say, here's what you owe. I want to be the guy that says, if you do this, you can legally avoid the taxes, just like the big companies do. When I take a new client, I say, so 
do you make more or less than Apple computer? We all laugh, ha ha, we make less than Apple computer. And I said, but guess what? You pay more taxes than they do. And then we go into tax planning. And most small businesses spend most of their time working really hard. And at the end of the year, they grumble about how much taxes they have to pay. A tax return should be a mere summarization of a year's worth of tax planning. And that's the number one reason I became a tax attorney. It's funny because just getting business owners to have a tax conversation before the year ends is difficult enough. You know what I say to clients, I have clients that say that I'm too busy. And I say, okay. And I say, suppose I told you that I had a client that I wanted you to meet. was going to pay you a lot of money. Would you have time for, well, of course. I said, okay. Well, that's the tax planning. And the bottom line is profits first. That's your book. And I say, in order to have profits first, you want to keep as much of those profits as you can and not give it to the IRS legally. And that's what I'm all about. And that's what tax planning is all about. And that's what the big companies do. The big companies have an army of people like me that say, do this and, and do that. I talked about Apple Computer. Take a look at its, its leader now, Tim Cook. Tim admits that he spends a lot of his time at Apple going over tax savings, tax planning, not how the computer works, but tax planning. That is so vitally important. And that's what your listeners really need to understand. This makes a major difference. And you see how much you can save in one year. You multiply that by the time you're going to spend in your career. And the difference can be retiring on a fortune or saying, gee, you, you, you can't afford to retire and you're basically working the rest of your life just to meet expenses. So I think a lot of small business owners think that these tax savings are only a, available to large companies. And so the can question- I use a, Can I use a strong word on your show? I don't know yeah. about profanity. Are you ready? Sure. Bill Feathers. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that out. And the bottom line is tax planning is something for all different levels of people. You just obviously suit it for the individual and their circumstance where they are now. And if you do the tax planning, you know what? All of a sudden, you may have a lot more money to grow and make a lot more profit. Profits first. So let's talk about this. Can you give us some examples of some tax planning that a small sure. business owner could use? Let's say a woman is a medical doctor and she's making half a million bucks a year from her medical practice. And she also has a rental building and the rental building is generating a million dollars in profits. And you say, well, gee, you know, tax on a million and a half bucks, that's a lot of money. And she listened to your show and said, hey, what would this guy Steve do for me? Well, first thing I'd say is she's married to a house husband. And she says, honey, I'm going to go ahead and have you manage the building. And we qualify him to become a real estate professional. Then we do something called cost segregation analysis. Now, if we have a building, we know that if it's a commercial building, we have to depreciate it over 39 years. And if it's residential building 27 and a half. That's a long time to wait for your benefits. So what cost segregation analysis is, we send an engineer to your building and he or she goes over and says, well, you know, this part is 39 or 27 and a half year property, but this part's 15 year property. This part is 10 year property. This part is five year property. So we greatly accelerate the depreciation. Now with our accelerated depreciation, we wipe out million dollar profit. Now remember, we have the most beautiful thing in life, a positive cash flow with a tax loss. This brings a tear to the eye. And what happens here is remember, you're not writing a check to depreciation. This is just an entry that your tax preparer makes. But now instead of the, even though she has that million dollars profit from her rental for the year, her tax return shows there's no profit. So we pay no tax on that million dollar profit. 
But when somebody gives you something nice, what do you say? Thank you. But lawyers say, more. I want more. I want more. And our, our doctor here wants more. So what happens is we say, well, let's assume that besides wiping out the million dollar profit, we have a, a loss here of half a million bucks on paper through our accelerated depreciation. Then we say, okay, now what do we do? Well, generally the accountants will tell you, and as you know, I was a CPA before I was a, a tax attorney, so I'm familiar with this too. Well, look, you know, the rental loss is a passive loss and therefore you can't use it to offset ordinary income like the profits from your medical practice. But remember, we turned hubby into a real estate professional, and it doesn't take very much to qualify for real estate professional. That's an exception to the Internal Revenue Code Section 469, the passive activity loss rules. And now we can offset the loss from the real estate, and they're a married couple, so only one of them has to qualify. Now we can offset the loss on the building, half a million in my example, against her wages. And now what we have is this couple has made a million and a half dollars, but they legally haven't paid any income tax on it. And I could go on and on and on and on and on. For example, let's say she's been doing this for a while. And she says, well, you know, eventually these things are going to turn around. What's going to happen? So she sells the building and says, oh, now there's your capital gain. She says, well, wait a minute. I have 180 days to put that money into an opportunity zone and defer that capital gains. And remember, a bill you can pay tomorrow is always less painful than a bill you have to pay today because instead of giving the money to the IRS, you keep the money, you can invest it and make money on money that you otherwise would have given to the IRS. So you say, well, okay, what happens when I sell the building in the opportunity zone? If you meet the rules, you're exempted from the capital gains tax. So she makes a fortune on the next building, doesn't pay any capital gains tax. And you say, well, all right, what are, what are other things we can do? Well, she and hubby are living in a, in a very nice home. And as a matter of fact, they bought the home 40 years ago and they bought it for $100,000. And now the home's worth five million bucks. The kids have moved out and they're rattling around and they want to retire. And well, gee, I, I really want to dispose of the house, but I don't want to pay seven figures in capital gains taxes. So we say, well, what about a 1031 exchange? You say, well, wait a minute. 1031s are only for business property and that's their personal residence. Very, very super easy to convert that primary residence into business property. The Congress is especially generous in the real property area. So now we've converted the property and we say, well, okay, now what are we going to do? We're going to do an exchange, but I don't want to be a landlord. So what we do is we now are going to exchange what used to be our principal residence, not for another real property, but for a DST, Delaware Statutory Trust. The Wall Street Journal has quoted me on how to do this. So now what happens is the house is gone. We pay zero capital gains tax. And now we have a, essentially a portfolio of real property stock, kind of like a mutual fund in real estate. So there's no taxes. Then we say, all right, if we had sold the property, we have an enormous capital gain and maybe some people are going to live on that property for the rest of their lives. But instead of this, we have this enormous capital gain and taxes go away. By doing the DST, you only sell the shares when you want to cash out and you only sell as many shares as you need in cash. So you spread those taxes over the rest of your life, which means money that you otherwise would have given to the IRS, you still have in your fund and you still are earning money on it. Now, you're very old right now. And what is the last thing a person is thinking about when they're on the deathbeds? 
Estate taxes? Exactly. You're learning and how to avoid them. So what happens is, let's say that the person, well, we'll call him grandpa, is, is done all these things, or it's our doctor, whoever. And you say, okay, I bought this building when it cost me $10,000 many years ago. Now the building's worth a million. If I just gave that to my beneficiary, I would go ahead and have to pay a capital gains tax on $990,000. That's a lot of money. But if you do it through your estate, you get what's called a step up in basis. So what happens is, even though grandpa paid 10,000 for the building, or excuse me, our, our medical doctor, now it's in the DST, but when she leaves the DST to her beneficiary, the beneficiary gets a step up in basis. So now we say, okay, let's assume the beneficiary sold the property the next day. So the tax return says sales price a million dollars, but the cost is not $10,000, not grandma's cost, but instead it's the fair market value at the date of the death of the decedents, a million dollars. A million minus a million is zero. You have a million dollars cash in hand, not a penny of taxes. And one of your listeners says, uh, you know what? That's great because the, the good doctor had kids, but I don't have any kids to leave it to. How about me? And I say, well, let's do this. For you, let's do a CRT, Charitable Remainder Trust. So what happens is let's see these people say, you know what? I want to live in my house for the rest of my life. And then I want my spouse to live in the house the rest of their lives. But when the second of us passes, I want the money to go to charity. Well, that's nice, but you don't get any tax benefit from that unless you set up the CRT. So what happens with the CRT? Everything physically stays the same. You live in that house the rest of your life. Your spouse lives in there the rest of his or her life. Well, when the second spouse passes, then the charity of their choice gets the property. Guess what? You get the tax deduction now. So what happens is an actuary comes in and values what did you keep and what did you give away? Let's assume, I'm gonna make up a number, that the real property had an equity of a million dollars. And the actuary says, well, based on your ages, what you kept was worth 300 and what you gave away was 700. You now have a $700,000 tax deduction. You say, Steve, that's great, but I don't have $700,000 worth of income to offset it. No problem, you can carry it forward. So look what the tax planning did here. Physically, the way I've suggested, everything is the same. Both spouses live there until the end of their days, and then the charity of their choice gets the property. But the first way, there was no tax benefit. The second way, they've avoided income taxes on $700,000 of income, so less taxes and a better life. And I could go on and on and on and on, but you're starting to get the idea. And, and now, being that your show, maybe you have something you'd like to say. No, I think that's great. And I think for everyone, it's slightly different, and you have to have the conversations in those particular situations. I've heard so many horror stories where... You know, for example, as people get older, they're like, oh, I want to sell this building. And so the accountant says, OK, sell the building. And then they're like, well, why don't you give the money to the charity? And they're like, excuse me? Had you told me that that's where the money was going, we could have structured the deal so differently. So you know fault that is? It's the fault of the professional. If I go to a medical doctor, I don't say, check my this and check my that. And what's the number here? I sit down in his or her chair and I expect the doctor to check whatever needs to be checked and do whatever needs to be done and tell me, look, you're, this is high and this is low and whatever. So what you never want to hear from your tax attorney or CPA or anybody else, oh, too bad you did it that way. And that's what tax planning is all about. And you can have fancier things too. Suppose we have this situation. Suppose mom and dad own the building with their adult kids. And mom and dad say, you know what? We want to cash out and sit on the beach. And the kids say, you know the cap gains tax? No, no, no. I want to I want to go ahead and get another building. I like being a landlord. Mom and dad says, well, I don't want to be a landlord anymore. So now what do we do? 
Oh no, do we, we have dueling pistols at dawn? What do we do? So we do something called the drop and swap, where essentially both parties get what they want, where the kids get to do a 1031 and get to exchange for a building, and mom and dad get to cash out. But what we've just learned, if I was representing mom and dad, I would say you can get the cash if you want, but unless you plan on spending it all in year one through the DST, and then you have a fund that's earning for you, and you only sell the shares as you want the cash. And again, this all in the tax law. This is there for the taking. So a common question I get is, well, why doesn't everybody do this? Because they don't know about it. And here's the example I give. I call it my million dollar business card. Suppose I had a special business card and I said, Rocky, I'm gonna put this business card down on your desk. And if you take this to the IRS, they're gonna write you a check for a million dollars. Would you go ahead and do that? Sure. Okay. Example two, I get a big dump truck and I fill it with business cards. Then I put in my magic business card and I get a big shovel and I stir it all up. I back the truck up to your office before you get in the morning and I dump all those business cards in your office. You walk in the door and say, oh my God, look at this office. What happened? Was there an accident? Was it vandals? I, what a mess. Get this out of my sight. And you hire somebody to clean up all the business cards. And guess what? You threw out the million dollar business card. What I have just described to you is how the tax code, the tax law looks to the average person when they look at it. It's those million, it's those, all those business cards strewn all over the office. It's a mess. You just want to get it out of your sight and you throw away the magic business card. It's there. You need to know where to look. That's what I've dedicated my career to. I know where to look to get the million dollar business card. So if I came into your office, I would extract the magic business card, give that to you and get rid of the rest of them. That's what the tax law is all about. So one of the complaints I get from business owners is A, their CPAs never tell them these things. That's where I became a tax attorney. <laughs> a, a big fault that I have with CPAs, and I can say this because I was a CPA first, is CPAs are exactly like that. CPAs are very conservative. They don't talk. They just push the numbers from one place to another. That is why I became a tax attorney because I didn't want anybody saying that to me. And unfortunately, I'm not saying every CPA in the world, but it's been my experience over the years that that's typical with a lot of CPAs. It is. The other problem they have is they don't communicate well. And a lot of times there's a communication gap on both sides, I think. They don't know how. That's the fault of the professional. It's the professional, just like my doctor example. If I go to the doctor and I have something terribly wrong with me, and unless he does something, I'm going to drop dead. I expect the doctor to say, look, we got to put a stint in you or you're going to drop dead. Put the stint in, you'll be fine. That's the doctor's job. It's the job of the professional to do that. Now, I do pride myself in my communication. Part of that is because I've had a lot of media experience. I have been a TV legal analyst for 17 years, seven years on Fox, 10 years on NBC, and also 30 years live radio, where I get on the radio every day live and give advice. So I guess I'm a little bit more used to talking to people than the average attorney or CPA, but that's an advantage if you come to us. Everybody says that I can explain a complex subject in understandable terms. And whatever the client's level of understanding is, I want to have him or her understand that. And I'm a simple guy. I just want to save them taxes. Simple. And I've yet in my entire career for somebody to say, Steve, how do I pay extra? There is a provision in the tax law to do that, by the way, but no one has ever asked me to invoke it for them. Let me know if you want me to do that for you. No, thanks. And I notice, and, and, and I blame politicians for this. You know, politicians say we should all pay more taxes, but I never see them send in an extra dollar either. No. Nobody does. And it it's hilarious. So let's talk about one of my favorite, favorite ways to save on taxes. And the reason it's my favorite way is because a lot of times in business, everyone is told, 
oh, buy this, it's a tax deduction, in which case I'm taking money and giving it to someone else and making them rich, and, and they're probably smart and they'll get good tax deals. I prefer to give the money to myself and get a tax deduction. And the government allows us to do that through a ton of different types of retirement accounts where we essentially can give the money to ourselves and get a tax deduction. I love retirement accounts. I talk about them all the time. There's over 20 different types, and there's four big advantages. One, you save taxes. And most people at that point say, okay, I'm sold. But the other advantage is two, you don't pay any income taxes on your retirement account earnings while the money sits in your account. Three, cash flow. In almost all cases with most deductions, you have to write the check by December 31st, year one, in order to deduct that from year one. Not with a retirement account. You get up to, with most of the plans, you get up to the filing of the return plus extension. So basically, we can be about three quarters of the way into year two. I tell a new client about a pension because I never heard about that stuff before. We can set it up. The client can fund it. So we set it up in year two. The client funds it, puts the money in year two, but we can still deduct it in year one. And last but certainly not least, asset protection. You know, you're in business and unfortunately in today's economy, people want to sue you. They're quick to sue business people. And if the plaintiff wins an amount in excess of your insurance, one lawsuit can wipe out a lifetime of working and earnings and savings. Except with your pension account, there's special federal laws that protect it, meaning the plaintiff can't take it away from you. And although I hate to mention his name, the poster boy for this is O.J. Simpson. As we know, he's had a multi-million dollar judgment against him for many years. He's not lost a penny of his pension. So I love pensions, and there's all kinds of great things you can do. And when I'm talking, and I use the term pensions and retirement accounts interchangeably, although technically it's not. But anyway, what happens is most people think about most popular ones, and IRA, a SEP, things like that, and they're fine. And before the show, we were talking about income level, and maybe that's right for somebody at a certain income level. But I like the fancy ones, like the cash balance plans, which is kind of like a defined benefit plan, where people can put in Boku, and you have a business, and then if the business owner is married and the spouse works there, and the spouse is compensated for reasonable compensation for services actually performed, you have another deduction. And then the kids, imagine this, when your kids graduate from college, instead of owing a bunch of money on student loans, they have a big bank account that's sitting there waiting to take care of them whenever the kid wants it. And you can set them up so you can take the money long before 59 and a half if you want to. So the bottom line is there's so very much you can do. And, And again, to make this really simple, when I talk to clients, I say, okay, You want to pay more or less taxes or be left and says, yes. And exactly, exactly what you said, Rocky, instead of writing that big check to the IRS, they're writing a big check themselves for their pension account. That's just one of the things in tax planning, but I love pension. Are there other ideas that you have that we haven't had a chance to chat about? How many hours do you have? (laughs) We're going to try and keep it short. So we'll go for one more. Okay. So another thing that you want to take a look at is you don't want to be hit. Here's a a common problem with business owners. Unlike an employee that has taxes with help from every paycheck, the business owner doesn't have anybody withholding on his paycheck. And a lot of people just don't pay estimated taxes. And then somebody prepares the tax return and the business owner says, what? How much? No, you have to do something wrong. I can't owe owe that amount of money. And now they have a situation where the IRS says, hey, buddy, you should have been paying those taxes all along. So now what you do is you have to pay penalties and interest on the penalties. 
or maybe you spent the money and you don't have the money. So we have to work out some type of deal with the IRS, but there's still penalties and interest. So what I do is I recommend something very simple. Every business owner should have three checking accounts because most business owners just draw money, cash out of the business when they can and spend it. So what happens is you want to know what your marginal tax rate is. So if someone tells you, the person who pays your return says your marginal tax rate is X. So let's make up a number, let's say 25%. So what happens, you have three bank accounts, your business account, your personal account, and your tax account. And let's say you're gonna take 100 out of your account. Well, normally the business owner would just take the 100, spend it, and they can't pay his taxes. So I say, well, wait a minute. If your marginal tax rate's 25%, you're gonna draw two checks. You're gonna take 100 out of your business, but you're gonna put 25 into your tax account and you put 75 in your personal account. The 75 in your personal account, do whatever you want with it. But what happens is if you do this every time you draw money from the business, when it comes time to pay estimated taxes and estimated taxes are due April 15th, which is especially difficult for a lot of people because if they owe taxes on their tax return and you got to pay the first estimate and then 615, 915 and 115 in the next year, Plus, you say, oh, you know, the, the state taxes that I'm paying, along with the federal taxes, they got extra painful because now I can only deduct $10,000 on my federal return when I used to be able to deduct it all. And for some people, that was their largest deduction. Well, a lot of states have done workarounds. And what the workaround does is, I'm simplifying, but... Essentially, for example, like here in California, you pay it through your business and then you get a tax deduction. So it basically alleviates that problem of having it taken away from you. And a number of states have done that workaround. So if you're in a state that pays state income taxes, talk to whomever does your taxes. Say, hey, did our state enact one of those workarounds? So essentially... I can deduct the state taxes and I'm not limited to just the 10 grand. That's still another way to go ahead and save taxes. I could go on, but it looks like we're out of time. And that is one thing that I don't even think people realize is how they got limited on their uh, state and local taxes to the 10 grand a few years ago. And I notice a lot of times business owners don't actually look at their tax return to understand how it came to be. They just want to know the bottom line number. And that to me is somewhat of a mistake. You should have a little bit more detail into how we got to that bottom I line. I couldn't number. agree with that more. You are absolutely correct. And that's that's hurting people. They're throwing money away when they could instead put that in their own bank accounts. So so true. If people would like to learn more about your practice and how to connect with you, what's the best way for them to do that? They can either call us at 888-TAX-DEAL. That's 888-T-A-X-D-E-A-L, 888-TAX-DEAL, or online, MoskowitzLLP.com, M-O-S-K-O-W-I-T-Z-L-L-P.com. And we'll make sure to put that in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. I love talking about taxes. And when I work with somebody the first time, they all laugh, just like you're laughing. Ah, that guy's so funny. But people that know me and have worked with me for years know I really love talking about taxes because we can legally save people so much money. Thanks for inviting me. Hope you invite me back. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Remember, with Profit First, we have five bank accounts and we put our tax money aside up front along with our profit and our pay. That makes it easy. However, it doesn't mean we have to use our tax money for taxes if we can find a better opportunity. The tax laws are constantly changing, and there are special opportunities through COVID relief. You will need to find someone who specializes in tax planning, not tax preparation. Many firms do just that. They don't even do tax returns. They just consult on how you can get a better tax deal. The research and development tax credits are very generous, and you should also think through family tax planning, including college costs. The joy of being more profitable is higher taxes, 
but we can always find a profitable way to pay them. Some are super easy to implement. If you'd like for us to be a part of your profitability journey, we have different programs available ranging from do-it-yourself to one-on-one coaching. Our course, The Profit Blueprint, teaches you everything you need to know to transform your profitability. There are three different tiers ranging from DIY to done with you so that businesses of all sizes can get the support that's best. Join the waitlist in the show notes to get more information and be a part of the next cohort. If you want a done for you service, you can hire us as your chief profitability officers. We only work with a handful of clients, so they all get our full attention. We work with business owners who have or are growing to half a million to 10 million in revenue. You can use the scheduling link in the show notes to get on our calendar for a good fit conversation to see if we're the right people to support you and how we can help you. This episode of the Profit Answer Man podcast is brought to you by smbpodcastnetwork.com. The network is a collection of podcasts and shows from around the internet, which focus on bringing you interviews with amazing guests who share actionable advice, ideas, and information for small and medium-sized business owners and entrepreneurs. Visit www.smbpodcastnetwork.com to find more great shows and easily subscribe to be notified of new episodes. It's a great way to discover quality content. If you've discovered us via the network, then I hope you enjoy today's show and will consider subscribing directly so you never miss our episodes. If you want to learn about living the life of your dreams, check out my other podcast, Richer Soul. As we close out, let's repeat the mantra. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. Have an abundant and profitable week.